Eurobike 2023, day three. Getting tired, but there's still so much tech to see. I'm going that way. Just checking out some of the great looking bikes here on the orange stand. Uh, you might have seen the tech show this week that went out on Wednesday, actually, uh, where Anna and myself were talking about this, the Switch 6. Obviously, they launched the Switch 7, I think, last week or the week before, and now there's the 6. It looks so much nicer in the flesh than seen it in the pictures. I love this stuff. And you also got to love the fact it's got a proper like toolbox down here. Uh, they were joking around with actually calling it a filing cabinet, which cracked me up because they're just like having a bit of a laugh at themselves, but um, fully featured bike. But more importantly, they've got a brand new hardtail. Have a look at this. So this hardtail is actually, I'm gonna see if I can perch here for a minute. So this hardtail is actually handmade in Halifax, which really pleases me because this is orange going back to the roots. So I first visited orange and was hanging around with Leicester Noble actually. Had a factory tour in probably 2002, I'm gonna say, um, in the sort of era where 1.5 inch head tubes were like really starting to come in. And I got to see a load of bikes being handmade back in those days, so it's really pleasing that it's all come straight back in. Uh, internal style headset on there, 64 degree head angle, 75 degree seat angle. I think they're 425 chainsaws, I might be wrong on that one though. Uh, it's a mullet style configuration, so 27 and a half inch wheel on the back, 29 on the front, and it's a hardcore hardtail. I love it, it's cool and it's simple, and I quite like a hardtail sometimes. They kind of make you forget that uh, you take things for granted when you're riding a full suspension. And there is something just pleasingly simple about it. Uh, nice, simple cable routing as well. Straight in, straight out. What do you reckon? You like a hardtail? And there's also this as well. So this is the Gamex bike. You might have seen this for Lenza Hyde. You might have seen this in some of the tech videos we've also had up on the channel. I think filmed by Rich, actually, from the races. Right, we've got prototype bars on here. You've got a prototype pro taper stem there. You've got prototype brake levers. Now these levers are actually the same length as the ones you can see on the kids' bike that scale down for smaller hands, but they have the fatter blades. So they're designed for big fingers, basically. Uh, team racers and people have wanted a real stumpy little lever and they just feel, they feel awesome. They feel really good. You might notice the shifter on the front here, a little bit different. That's because that's got a pinion gearbox on here with a smart shift. We'll talk about that in a minute. Probably notice it's got a Dorado on here with the triple air spring on there, infinite rate tune. You've also got atmospheric balancing on these, so they call it trail side relief. You can actually hit that at the top of the fork. You've seen this style feature on some other forks. It's further down, a bit more difficult to get to. Beauty of an inverted fork. It's right up here. Uh, Dorado's always been one of my favorite forks. They're unbelievably plush. They're so good to work on and arguably one of the better forks out there on the market. Now, this frame, I'm gonna hop down here now you could say this is work in progress. So I think at the best possible sense, this is a prototype that's being raced. Everything's changing on it. On the shock, you've got MRD. That stands for Manitou Race Development. Every race these guys are going to, they're having the shocks reworked, revalved, using telemetry. They're really moving on with their technology. So Manitou were huge back in the day. And for whatever reason, they kind of went down, you know, I don't know, like a decade ago, but now they're coming back in a big way. So we've already seen the Mesa Fork, which is just incredible. If you don't know about it, do some research on that Mesa Fork. The triple air spring on there, the infinite rate tune that it's got built into it, how the damping works. It's just such a good fork and really intelligent, uh, but obviously they're working on stuff constantly. So expect big things from Manitou in the coming years. And then down here, of course, you've got a high pivot design. You've got a belt on here, the Gates carbon belt drive. And it's also the smart shift gearbox in here as well. So this gearbox currently is run on manual. So I'll tap the gears here and you can see them. Well, you can hear the noises making. You can't see anything moving. But it's also got a smart shift, which is essentially auto shifting. But that is calibrated to each rider, the way they ride, the cadence. And it's just an incredible piece of kit. I don't know much more than that for now until I go and see Pinion, but what a bike just absolutely crammed with tech oh and one more thing apparently the racer of this bike has now chosen to run inserts in the front not because he needs them but actually for the noise because this bike is so quiet off-road all he could hear is his rims hitting the ground basically when he's going through rock gardens normally it's sort of that's cancelled out by the other noise on the bike this bike's literally all you hear is the shocks basically and the rims hitting the floor mega <sighs> Uh, just outside the DT Swiss stand, looking at Valentina Hull's bike, uh, you've got the FR 1500 wheels, that's their latest wheel to launch, but there's a few little cool things on here. Uh, check out the tiny little XO mech on the back there, it's always nice to see something a bit older. External cable route in, direct, pleases me. And then up front, 
that's that new boxer. Well, that's the, the black box version anyway of the new boxer that's about to launch with the 38mm tubes on there. But nice looking fork, nice looking bike, eh? Okay, so every year at Eurobike, there's always something very special. And what we've seen in the last couple of years is some very special bikes from Danger Home, uh, Gustav. Uh, last year, I loved chatting to you about your bikes, but you've just, you've just gone above and beyond again. I have to say, I didn't even realize that was an e-bike when I first walked past. Then I saw the weight of this thing, 12.9 kilos for an e-bike, it's insane. Do you want to just talk us through some of, some of this? Because it's just, there's an overwhelming amount of stuff going on here, like a custom derailleur, the custom battery in your hand, the rope spokes, like all this stuff. Yeah. Um, let rip. That, that's the thing that when you're trying to build the world's lightest bike, you obviously can't overlook any detail. So it's really like all in with everything, every gram counts. But to start with the basics, it's based on a standard Scott Lumen frame in size large but without the paint, so that saved about 150 grams. It has a standard Intend Samurai TR fork, 130 millimeter. So, so, so far so good, you know. But uh, then when it comes to the drive unit system, the, the fun really begins. Yeah. So the drive unit system, I actually had the opportunity to work closely with the TQ, and it's the TQ HPR 50 system, so it's a lightweight 50 Newton uh, drive unit and a 360 watt hour battery. But what's cool with the battery is that TQ <laughs> actually custom made a carbon fiber casing for this battery, including uh, proper shielding and everything. Yeah. So this thing alone saves over 200 grams compared to the standard battery. 200 grams. 200 grams. <laughs> and that must cost a small fortune. I mean, this is one of the more valuable things here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, also we actually did some things with the drive unit itself. So it has prototype ceramic speed bearings throughout, which saves a surprising amount of weight. And also we have uh, hollow titanium mounting bolts made in Italy by METI. And they are half the weight of the steel mounting bolts. So 30 versus 60 grams. Wow. And, and then the cranks, like that's... You taking the paint off those? Yeah, the yeah. cranks are actually standard E13, but I was positively surprised about the super cool 3K finish. So those are also really light, 378 grams. So 328 grams, so, so that's really cool. And then I mean to continue with the spec, we have a quite special uh, cockpit with a Darima one-piece unit, 174 grams, trick stuff, piccolo brakes, custom twin lock remote for the rear suspension, a jet dropper paired to the super light podio seat post and a MCFK carbon fiber saddle. The wheels are high rope with the Duke rims. So these are textile fiber spokes, synthetic fibers. The tensile strength is actually higher than on steel spokes. So they have a little bit more flex and vibration dampening, which can be a good thing, but they are super light, of course. So 945 grams for the wheel set. That's unbelievably light. Yeah. Um, the rotors as well? What are the rotors? The rotors are so cool. It's from an Italian brand called Carbon TI. Yeah. And uh, carbon fiber centerpiece with a steel rotor surface. So super light, but still, you know, you have full performance because you can have more steel in the actual brake surface and yeah. still keep the weight low. Yeah, sure. But uh, the thing I'm probably most happy about with the bike is the custom uh, derailleur. The derailleur, yeah. And this is like a true Franken derailleur. I don't think anyone has ever done something like this before. So this pinochle here, housing all the electronics, that part comes from a Rode SRAM Red ETAP 11 speed derailleur. Yeah. These parts here are 12-speed Explorer and with an Explorer wide-range uh, derailleur cage from yeah. Ceramic Speed. So this is a wireless, wide-range, 11-speed system. It's completely custom and the, the only one. With the only one, speed. Yeah. And Presumably you went for 11-speed to like, just shave more weight off. Yeah, exactly. And also it makes kind of sense on an e-bike where you have some assistance. Yeah. Maybe you don't need that close of a gearing range and the uh, big granny gear, you know, so. So in the past, if I've done anything with SRAM stuff like change a decal, yeah. I've had raised eyebrows. What do they think of that? Well, I, I'm not sure if they like <laughs> applaud it or or the opposite. But yeah. <laughs> but uh, I know that I maybe keep an eye on what I do, and uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> I, I love it, uh, dude. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thanks for taking time to 
tell us about all of this twice so I could get my head around it. Um, what do you reckon of this? This is by far the nicest looking, the coolest and the maddest bike I've seen at this show. Uh, go for it in the comments down there. Thank you once again. My pleasure, thank you. You probably know that I've been a huge fan of Nikolai bikes for some time and this is a Nucleon and I mean, look at the thing, right? Lovely high pivot up the top here, a huge idler wheel there to make sure that's really efficient to use. Obviously this one is running a UDH setup on the back with the latest SRAM setup on there. But there's also the one next door that I looked at last year with the Lao Supra drive on it. What I wanna know is, what would you rather have of the two? Now, I've not actually ridden this yet. But I've gotta say, as incredible as this tech is, I think I would rather have this one. Have a look at this. So essentially, the same bike as what we're seeing next door, but this one is using that Lao Supra drive. Now, I've done a huge piece on this last year's show. I think we actually were speaking with uh, Cedric about this bike as well, but in case this looks a bit confusing to you and you're not aware of what's going on, think of your regular derailleur that hangs down here. You have an upper wheel and you have a lower wheel. Pulley wheels, guide wheels, jockey wheels, whatever you want to call them. There's still one wheel here, but what that wheel does is literally just change the gears. So that doesn't have to be here. So what they've done is move it up out the way so you don't have anything down here to bash, but you're still using the system with the lowest friction instead of a gearbox, yeah? So it's kind of a weird hybrid setup. You're getting rid of the problem of the derailleur down here by moving up here. And then of course, the other thing you need to do is spring the chain or make sure the chain is sprung. Normally that would happen with the lower wheel, the one that's lower down to getting hit. But instead, they do that with this one here. So this is actually sprung loaded. I can only just move that. But you can see that deals with the cable tension and then other than that it's a conventional high pivot design uh, it just might look confusing but i think this is an incredible system and i'm kind of surprised i've not seen it creep onto other people's bikes i wasn't surprised when it was on the on the nikolai bike to start with but it's looking great it's looking refined these days what would you have out of the two if you had a choice would you have this version of the nucleon using that lao super drive or would you have the one behind me that's got that brand new access on there hanging from the udh food for thought. Pirelli have got a name in motorsport. I'm sure a lot of you will know that. And I'm sure a lot of you realize that they're starting to get much more of a name in mountain biking, thanks to their appearance on several bikes in the UCI World Cup. I've got to say, I've seen these tires get better and better over the years. We saw the very first range of the Scorpion tires and their concept of having the same name of all the tires and they pick different conditions for the tires. And that's the way they choose the rubber, the structure, the, the tire tread on them. It's all about this for me. Like the rubber compound on this feels insane and the casing is so protective on these. The guys over on EMBN are actually running these tires at the moment. Jonesy's running these. I've not had any time on them, but you're gonna see a lot more of these guys in the future. Uh, check the bike behind me, there's a Canyon Sender and it's got the seriously soft compound tires. I haven't got my durometer to test it to see what they are, but they've got to be like 40A or something at least. They're super, super soft. Good stuff. WTB or Wilderness Trail Bikes have been around for many years. We always come and see some of the new stuff at Eurobike. And this year, they've just got some updates on the Silverado and the Vault saddles. Now, you might look at them and think they look fairly similar, but actually the profiles have changed slightly. The way they're manufactured has changed slightly. And actually, their design structure is very different in terms of the end user. So they've got this fusion form technology that the way they're actually constructed. And the actual saddles themselves, the weaves in them, the way they're produced, offers different amount of flex for different style riders. So the gravel focused saddle, for example, has a lot more flex in the center region of the saddle because you're gonna be spending more time, arguably, pedaling on slightly rough sort of vibration surfaces. So it's designed to just increase that comfort there. Beautifully made from underneath. This one's a Volt carbon rails on here. Nice and light, lovely shape on there. It's got that shape that's always had the same silhouette. And then of course you've got the Silverado, again, a very popular saddle. As with many saddles you're seeing these days, the nose length is coming in slightly, but it's nice and wide to get the perch on the front there. And you might have seen Mark Weir's video with the Focus saddle with the, the grip in the back. I've got to say, I absolutely love this approach. Um, have a look at his video, actually. You'll probably find it might get served up after this one. Now, saddle discomfort is something that people discuss a lot of the time, and getting the right saddle for you can be very difficult if you are someone that has like problematic body size or shape, or you just ride for hours on end and stuff for, for numbness. So you've obviously got the classic width that you can adhere to, but the intention of the saddle is equally as important. Some saddles are incredibly padded, and it's not the amount of padding that makes it comfortable, it's the support on there 
for your sit bones essentially but also in addition to that is the flex in the body now these saddles have some new features on them obviously if you're going to be picking a saddle for downhill the saddle is going to be intended to be take a hard hitting if the bike crashes whereas a saddle focused for gravel riding is going to have flex in there you've got to think the user intention in combination with that don't be put off just looking at a saddle thinking oh it's too thin for me that's not the one super important to get these things right same with grips it's another contact point what works for you ain't gonna work for me a little while back on one of the bike build projects I did on GMBN Tech I built a bike and I used some rental grips that had really soft tacky rubber and they actually had a twin collar lock on design I've just had a feel of these grips the tangent contour grips and they're unbelievably sticky so using the more modernized single collar approach just like the other grips I just showed you these grips can be perfect if, you, if, like me, you like to run in wet weather and also don't like to use gloves. Like, honestly, they feel sticky. It almost feels like the rubber's melted, but they are so, so good. They've got grips for everyone on the market. They've got the mushroom-style grips. You've got little ruffian minis for the kids. Uh, they've got everything, but they awesome for bare hands. So just one more random thing about handlebar grips, because I've got to say, it's a very overlooked thing when people are getting bikes. You could just spec a grip like this, get on with it and be happy about it. But the fact is, it's one of your contact points and what works for me might not work for you and vice versa. So just something to consider if you're having problems with the grip on the bike or the comfort and all those sorts of things is the profile and shape of your grips. These ones, for example, will have little finger slots in them. They're designed basically so you don't have to grip as hard as necessary. So if you're suffering from arm pump, a grip with a profile like this could be really good. They've got a mushroom texture here to relieve the sort of pressure on your hand. And they come in different sizes, like different thicknesses. Now, they might look fairly similar and there's only a couple of millimeters difference in them, but it feels massive, the actual difference between them, a thin grip and a big grip. I've got quite big hands, but I will always prefer to use a small grip. Uh, but that's unlike a lot of many other riders. So what sort of grips do you like to use? Thin, thick, plain profile? Do you like something that's textured to help with the feel of your hands? All things to consider when you're buying a new set of grips. <laughs> Look at the head angle on that thing. Actually, check this out. This has got that new DT fork on it. I saw this over there, just been launched, F5351. So this fork, like, well, actually you can't really tell from the outside. It's got a few very cool things going on. So on the air leg at the bottom of the inside, it's got a small coil spring. Think of it as an isolator between that rod and the bottom of the fork. And it works, I think, for the first 30 millimeters of travel, so it makes it ultra sensitive off the, off the top. Basically like a vibration damper type setup. A little bit like buttercups that Rock Shocks have got, but using a coil spring. Gotta love that. And then the actual damper itself, unlike speed sensitive dampers you tend to have, this one's more like a position sensitive damper. So essentially it's got like an IFP with a hole basically allows the fluid to pour through. And the effect of this, it means when the IFP is basically above that hole, it means the fluid can freely move in and out. So you've got no damping applied at all and that's at the top of the stroke there. So I think it's the first two centimeters of travel, it's extremely supple. Then as the port starts closing, you start getting a bit more support as the low speed compression kicks in. And when the port is fully closed, the oil then routes around the high speed port. And that's of course when you're in the last part of the travel when you need all the support. I like it, real intelligent way. Not utterly convinced about a, what we're we gonna say that is. I wanna say that's our 57, 57 degrees. It's 57 degrees, but, but hey, it got me here to look at that. Let's get going. My day is complete. I've got a trick stuff brake lever that's actually a bottle opener. <laughs> you know me and my bottle openers. I mean, anything opens a bottle, but... Uh... <laughs> Check that out. That's three days of Eurobike done. I am absolutely spangled. My feet are hurting. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty and I need a shower. But it's been awesome. It's been so much great tech to see privileged to speak to some very cool people like Gustav at like Danger Home. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed by what he does. I think it's incredible. It's totally unachievable for most people. But uh, yeah, some very cool stuff. And I've also seen some very cool stuff from, from a company of which I'm sitting on their stand, but I can't tell you about it yet. So you'll have to use your imagination about that. Uh, I'd love to know what you think was the coolest thing in today's video. If you haven't seen yesterday's video or the day before, please do check those out as well, because there's loads of great stuff. And I see you when I get back to the studio.